Variants that are best adapted to a given environment can do remarkable things to animals and in a time scale that's completely compatible with the needs of the animals uh, to uh, adapt to different environments. So I'll stop there and I'd be happy to take uh, more questions. Yeah. Um, I actually had a question about um, what you had mentioned earlier about the dog breeders. Yeah. Um, well, when you're creating dogs for beauty, what would happen if these dogs were not used for domestic purposes anymore and then they were placed out in the wild? Would they go extinct because they've not evolved like the wolf has to adapt to such an environment? Or how would that work? It's a great question. What would happen if the dog breeds were released in the wild? And this is actually... Uh, it's an interesting question because one of the old arguments about whether artificial selection was relevant to the way evolution would work is a lot of people said, well, if you release those dogs in the wild, you know, they'd be toast, right? I mean, the, uh, and therefore, the kinds of genetic architectures that underlie the major changes that humans have been able to achieve aren't relevant for the kinds of genetic mechanisms that might underlie a process of natural selection to change an environment. So I think that's one of the things that's so striking about the stickleback results. There's no humans involved in trying to sculpt these organisms to adapt to these new post-glacial lakes. And yet if you go in and use exactly the same sort of genetic archaeology methods to try to investigate what kinds of genetic changes underlie those differences, in fact, the architectures are in many ways surprisingly similar. That You can get major genes that uh, have uh, substantial effects on huge, uh, huge structures. And I think that uh, that shows the power of what genes can do and the power of what selection can do by acting on those genes. Yeah. Uh, isn't it possible with all the, like the constant F1 crosses that like with like the dogs, the maize, and the sticklebacks that um, the, like the results will be affected by inbreeding? Because you, you're you assume that you're breeding the same like the children from the same parents over and over. The question is whether you get inbreeding effects when you do these sorts of crosses, and you can. So there are uh, recessive mutations that can be present in populations. As Sean said, mutations occur randomly. So during the replication of DNA, you'll get errors. Those uh, sometimes are uh, not apparent unless uh, the genes, the same uh, mutation is on both chromosomes. So they may have occurred originally on one, but when you start to inbreed, you bring those uh, mutations together. So that absolutely uh, can be seen, uh, uh, inbreeding um, inbreeding effects that, uh, that plague, plague breeders because you have to find the stuff that you want amidst the stuff that, um, that, that you might not want. And I think what that really serves to emphasize is something that came up also in the questions this morning. The process of mutation itself is random. It's not that the corn or the Tiacente knew what corn should look like or that the dog breeders um, were able to pick pre-existing uh, traits that had already varied in the way that, that somebody wanted to have happen. The mutations occur at random. They can be advantageous. They can be disadvantageous. What selection does is it screens. The ones uh, that are bad are eliminated. The ones that are good can be chosen, either by a human breeder or by the process of a mutation having a 1 or a 5 or a 10% advantage in overall survival or, uh, or reproduction. Uh, we'll take one uh, in, the, in the red shirt. Does the understanding of the evolution of teosinte to corn, has that played a big role in the genetic enhancement of like common agricultural products, like the giant tomatoes, or how they're improving the world's source of food? And so very similar experiments have been going on to look at the genetic basis of uh, domestication traits in other animals and plants. So part of the motivation of that research is if we understood the genes that made crops better for humans, it might actually be possible to move those genes around and in a more designed, targeted approach, uh, improve plants. So there's very similar work that's gone on for tomatoes to try to identify the genes that make tomatoes you know, big, big and juicy. Um, there's similar work that's going on in uh, lots of different organisms. So far, I don't know of any examples where one of the domestication genes that has been found in uh, this plant has been moved over into another one. But I do think that the better our understanding is of how you can change plant architecture, the better long-term hope there is uh, for achieving uh, real improvements that are based on trying to modify our knowledge of the genetic pathways of how the structures develop. <laughs> Off by one. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a question? I gathered from the uh, opening video that in your laboratory you do sort of similar ideas with the fish as in the uh, Cornell Anatomy Farm. 
do you do this uh, like just through breeding or through uh, some sort of a other form of manipulation of food? Yeah, the, the stickleback project in the lab is very focused on trying to analyze the genetic basis of natural variants that have never been manipulated in humans. So lots of people who work on model organisms may set up mutagenesis experiments to try to identify uh, rare variants that uh, test what it's possible to do to an animal in the laboratory. The stickleback project is very geared towards trying to understand how nature has redesigned animals and natural environments. So all of the crosses are taking wild-caught fish that have adapted in different areas and then trying to carry out these sorts of experiments to identify what genes have made them uh, look the way that they do. Okay, uh, I think we better take one last question. Yeah. Um, because people breed the dogs so many times different ways, are like, they still as close as they were to wolves like, in their components? Like, could you still breed them with wolves? Are they still, like, close in, like, uh, like how cousins or something like that? So um, uh, one of the most remarkable demonstrations of how closely related dogs and wolves actually still are is the fact that you can breed wolves and dogs. They'll make uh, fertile hybrids. The Dog Genome Project uh, has just recently uh, been carried out. We've got a lot of sequence information now from dogs, and you can ask what other organisms are the most closely related to dogs based on DNA sequence. That confirms the same thing that uh, people knew from breeding experiments, that uh, dogs come uh, are very closely related to wolves. You can see that both by the inner fertility and from uh, similarity in DNA sequence. You are the easiest toss of the day. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks very much. Um, we're happy to take uh, more questions at the break. You've asked great questions, and I'll give it back to Peter. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm really glad that we selected you to give that lecture. It's really exciting, I think, to, to learn how uh, evolution is working in living populations now uh, and to see the mechanisms behind it. There were all those good questions, and there were many more, and I know our audience out there in the virtual world couldn't ask their questions anyway, but there is a way you can ask these questions. That website I mentioned before, biointeractive.org, has a section called Ask a Scientist. You can go to that section and put in a question, and our panel of volunteer scientists will answer it for you. Not only will you get an answer back, but if we think the question is generally interesting and the answer is a good one, uh, then we'll put it on the site for others to see. And there's an archive of questions and answers and a search function. So it's actually a pretty good resource in a lot of things. So that's Ask a Scientist on uh, biointeractive.org. That was a commercial message. Um, so join us again tomorrow uh, for two more lectures on evolution from our speakers. David will explore the connections between the fossil evidence and molecular evidence uh, for evolution. And Sean will move our evolutionary thinking from insect wings to human traits. Thank you. Thank you.